We have more fun than you could ever imagine. From the Independence Institute, Amy Cook and Ross Izzard, wanted to pull up a couple of final things from the session. I wanted to talk particularly about this governor's energy office. What is the governor's energy office and how in the world did it get defunded? Well, actually, it is now the Colorado Energy Office. It's gone through a couple of iterations. But basically, last night, it was SB 301, so Senate Bill 301, one of the late bills that was introduced that included the reauthorization of the governor's energy office, started in the Senate, was sent over to the House. The House larded it up with things like, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. They sent it back to the Senate. So it's like 10 o'clock last night, and the Senate says, no, we're adhering to our original position. The House had already adjourned for the session, so no reauthorization of the governor's energy office. How much does this or the Colorado energy office. How much does this save taxpayers? It was about $3 million, I think. $3 million. Yeah. But it, it, and I should it say, helps. Yeah, well, well, yeah. And, and it's an office, by the way, that started back in the 70s. It was out of like a Texaco settlement. It was a, one of these settlement offices that was uh, created. We got some money. That was the seed money. It started and, and, it, and it started there. It, talk about this is the prime example of a government program that once it starts, never goes away until the 11th hour of on the last day of the session and they just couldn't come to an agreement on it and so therefore the re I have to give Ray Scott and the Senate Republicans a lot of credit for sticking with their original position and and not and they called the house's bluff they so, just said we're not doing it so why the Senate Republicans uh, or so many of them fell short on a 600 million dollar tax increase and a $1.8 billion <laughs> debt increase without a vote of the people, at least they held firm on $3 million uh, here. Roughly $3 million, and also a, a bunch of like, um, oh, special interest, government goodies, that kind of stuff. So I give them a lot of credit. I, I realize that there was a lot of things to criticize them for, but in this particular case, at the last hour, they stuck to their guns. Always charter schools and getting something close to equal funding for these public schools, it seems like it's a constant fight. What was the story this year? Yeah, so this year, they, last year we had a bill that tried to do that. It didn't get very far. The House Speaker said, no, we just would rather not do that. Didn't get too far. This year, they tried again, and it was sort of an interesting thing because the session started out really boring on the education side. I have a big whiteboard in my office where I write down the bills, and there were like, you know, 10 things on there. It was pretty boring. And then suddenly about halfway through, the charter funding bill, which would basically say that if you're a school district and you are collecting extra property taxes in the form of a mill levy override, you need to be sharing that with all the public schools in your district, including charter schools. So the Republican Senate passes that. It goes to the House. Uh, and all hell breaks loose. So from then on, the speaker puts it in her desk drawer. Uh, there were all sorts of negotiations behind the scenes. It sat there for about two months until the very last few days of the session. It suddenly was the Republicans put it into school finance and the Democrats took it out and then they put their version into school finance and then we all took it out and then it became House Bill 1375, which finally passed sort of so fast you could barely even see it uh, and got through. So it, it's a step forward, uh, but is I will be honest. Is it a big step forward or is it a symbolic step forward? It, it, depending on how you read it, it might not be either. So the problem here is that it's a, um, you, so it's, it's, it's probably progress, but the issue is that you have a situation here where if you're a district that really doesn't want to share this stuff, you can still not share it. You just have to not share it under these particular circumstances. I'm trying, I'm trying to get this across, which is, and, and these are the people in control of you know, $27 billion and, and our laws. Well, we, we, they don't know what they're voting on. There was something that was, we thought would be a pretty good victory. You know, a bit of cronyism for Excel Energy. No, I shouldn't say a big a bit. It's a big bit of cronyism. It's called des, uh, demand side management. And these things get lost because they never really make the news. But what was this and what's it going to cost us? And who's going to pay? <laughs> well, well, first of all, you will pay for it if you're an Excel Energy rate payer like I am or... Yeah. Everybody, four, most people point. watching this are. Right, and by the way, whatever Excel does often trickles down to the other rate payers. So while this, it, it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, um, what, what Excel does often just ends up everywhere else. So this, it's called demand side management, but what, what it really is, is them lecturing you to use less electricity. For that, because they're a monopoly and the PUC in its wisdom 
Public and Utilities this, Commission. And, and the state, and, and at the time, a democratically Democrat controlled state legislature said, well, we realize it goes against your interest, your business interest. So I'll tell you what, we're going to let you profit. We're going to let you recover the cost of telling people to not use your product. And then we're going to let you profit. And then it has all of these mechanisms that they can allow them to profit without limitation. So as well, an wait, 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 uh, Listen. <laughs> listen, I don't get it either. So, right, so, <laughs> so Excel is in the business of manufacturing electricity and power, selling that. Right. And under this, they're going to tell people to buy less of their product. Yeah. And so in exchange, they'll be able to just charge for what they didn't sell right. to, to those people. So in other words, you'll be using less electricity. Right. They will get paid for electricity they don't make. So right. they don't have that expense. Right. And so it's profit for doing nothing. That's it. Yeah, I think you explained that really. I think you got it. I think that you you did rather well with that. And in addition to that, they and, also they and also passed. Yes, the reauthorization of it passed. So we were hoping it would stop in the Senate. It didn't. Three three Republicans voted in favor of it. Beth Humenic, Ray Scott, and Kevin Priola. It was Kevin Priola's bill. He carried it for them. It is roughly, um, the Public Utilities Commission allows Excel to earn up to $30 million of additional profit on top of their demand side management program. So for instance, if they buy a, a whole slew of, you know, the curly Q light bulbs, and that's going to be their demand side management program. They buy a bunch of those. They get to recover the cost. There's a writer on your bill. Just look for demand side management on your bill. It's there. And then they get an authorized rate of return, roughly 10% on top. And so... So they take money from rate payers, mm -hmm. people who have to pay their electricity bill. Right. And with that, they, they do these things like buying curly Q light bulbs. Right. And not only does that pay for the light bulbs that they give away, yeah. but then they're able to mark it up and make 10% yeah. profit right. on, on that as well. But it as gets well. worse. Um, oh, it, well, it, it gets worse. <laughs> Don't worry. So it, it, gets, it gets a little worse. They, it was supposed to be to offset the cost of having to build additional capacity. Well, Excel has excess capacity. Everybody acknowledges that. They have so in their, much. In their, in their factory, they got plenty of room to, buy, to build have, more electricity. And not only that, but they sell they don't even sell it. They actually pay wholesalers to take their excess, and they're building more wind capacity that we're being charged for. And then um, to add insult to in injury, I actually give the Public Utilities Commission credit for this. They were honest. They said, really, this isn't about, you know, this isn't about curtailing demand. This is really about reducing the use of fossil fuels. That's the bottom line. They said that in their last, in their most recent decision. It but is it's, about this goes right back to, to the the Sonnenberg Grantham Great Betrayal, which is it's a tax increase. It is a tax. We increase. don't get to vote on. It's a so huge we'll be tax. paying more in our electricity bills, and we've had no say in this. Right. And it's just the government giving the monopoly the opportunity to make free. And money. I'll make this last point. Um, residential rates have gone up over sixty percent over the last decade plus. These demand side management is one of the four leading cost drivers of what we call the new energy economy. Those four cost drivers together cost the average rate payer. We figured this out in 2012 alone. Now, and rates have gone up since then. 2012 alone cost the average rate payer almost $350 additional per year. That's a $350 a year. per year tax on your bill that you had no say It's in. over a grand every three years. <laughs> right. And, and, Right. It, well, it, it continues to go up. All right. So when we get back to the cronyism of that and hear the power of those people who despise public schools that are charters, you know, th it is as if these outside forces have more influence under that dome than voters do. Am I, I, I know this is a big surprise to everybody, but as you've been getting more and more involved in this, what's, what's your takeaway? What have you learned? Yeah, it's, it's, I like that question. What have I learned? No, it's amazing. I mean, you go down there, and I, I think at the beginning of the session, in the middle of the session, you have folks who really want to have policy debates. We have thoughtful conversations about this stuff. And as you get to the end, and everybody, number one, is kind of over it, and number two, really wants those wins, those notches on their political belt. Suddenly, they're willing to make compromises. And when you're willing to make compromises, and oh, by the way, out in the lobby, you have four or five 
lobbyists from CEA, the teachers union, or another group that happens not to be a big fan of charter schools, it becomes sort of easier for that to happen, especially in the Democratic House where they can sort of reinforce those thoughts and really push down the road of, yeah, you're going to get something good out of it, but we're going to make sure we extract 10 pounds of flesh on the back end of it. Um, you have an awful lot of people down there in an awful lot of rooms, very few of which are open to the public, and you get decisions that are sometimes okay and sometimes not, but either way, it's, it's easy to feel uncomfortable with that. Less than a minute. Excel has such power there that we were joking when they had that uh, wrapping around the dome that when they peeled off the wrapping, there was going to be an Excel symbol which was something that just said, why rent when you can buy? <laughs> um, why is Excel so successful in pushing their agenda? What, what makes them so very powerful? They have great lobbyists. I mean, I mean, Ross is right when he says, you know, you, cut, you step outside and all those lobbyists are there. These are great lobbyists. And I will say this, Excel was very smart in hiring um, folks left over from the Owens administration. So you can get Republicans kind of on, on board, seemingly. Ah, uh, cronyism reigns supreme. Amy, thank you. Ross, thank you. Thank you. Listen for me on KHOW Radio. Read me in the Denver Post. Tell a friend about the Independence Institute. That's independenceinstitute.org. And we'll see you next week.